Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Lighthouse for Jesus, Sanctuary of Strength, Tuesday night Bible study. We are studying the Feast of Israel. We have already uh, gone over the Passover, which prophetically gives us the death of Christ. And we have gone over the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where Israel had to get rid of any leaven in their homes, in their environment, which speaks of sin. And that represents the burial of Christ. So we know that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we see that the gospel was being preached to Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai, even though they did not know that it was the gospel. In retrospect, we look back and we see the gospel. But those feasts don't just talk about those things that uh, were fulfilled in Christ. The last three, we're gonna have four that are about when Christ came the first time. The last three will be about the second coming of Christ. Uh, and so that, Chapter 23 of Leviticus, which is where we are studying from, uh, is a great book of prophecy in these feasts of Israel. Uh, as I said, the uh, unleavened feast, well, we'll talk about that a little more. Right now, we're going to read about the Feast of First Fruits, which is the third feast. Uh, and this one, it has more verses about it than Passover or uh, Unleavened Bread, but it's really uh, more simplistic in some ways. And in other ways, if you really get into it, you would never finish talking about it. So right now, Sister Tiffany is going to read for us Leviticus 23, verses 9 through 14. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest, priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer the day when ye wave the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an hen. And ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Okay. Praise God for that. Now. Uh, this is the third feast, the feast of first fruits, also called the feast of harvest in Exodus uh, 23 and 16, I believe it's called the feast of harvest. This feast was not to be observed until Israel came into the land of Canaan. So even though the instructions were given here, 
we're going to find, uh, I believe in numbers, the first time they celebrate it, but they cannot celebrate it until they get into the land. And of course, that's gonna be in 40 years because they're going to wander. But God gave them the command or commandment to do that feast. And that was a surety that they would in fact go into that land and possess that land. You notice in verse uh, 10, speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them, when you become into the land, not if you come into the land, when you come into the land. So that was a surety, a promise that they would have that land because God said, you will do this feast when you get there. This also is one of the three feasts where all of the men of Israel had to go to Jerusalem for that feast. As we read about it, we could see that this was a feast that celebrated and gave thanks for the harvest. They had to dedicate the first stalks of grain that were ripened. They had to dedicate those to God at the tabernacle. And uh, it was uh, gratitude, not just for what they had then harvested, but for a plentiful harvest to come before it even came. They were thanking God for it. And so they had to bring a sheaf of that grain tied together. And at this, uh, the first fruit that Passover would have been barley and uh, that would ripen around March. Uh, the sheaf from the crop was given to the priest or would be because they're not doing it now. And they, the priest had to wave it, had to take that sheaf and wave it in thanks and honor to God because you would have no crop without God. Then after uh, the sheaf was waved, they had to, uh, in verse 11, look at now uh, verse 12. And ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf, uh, he lamb without blemish. Now, that is a description of Christ. A he lamb without blemish. That was prophetic of Christ, of course. A male who had no sin. Then they had to uh, give a grain offering and a drink offering and pour it out at the base of the altar of sacrifice on the ground. It also tells us in verse 11, which day they were to do it. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. That would be Sunday. Again, prophetic. The morrow after the Sabbath is Sunday. And we're going to see what all of this has to do with Christ. Uh, it was prefiguring or foreshadowing the day that Christ would rise from the dead. Also, during this feast, the grain from the new harvest in verse 14, it says, you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the self same day that you have brought an offering unto your God. They could not eat of any of their the fruit of their labor until they brought an offering to God. 
They had to give thanks and they had to make those offerings to God first. Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits on a Sunday following the Passover. Y'all, this is like just so awesome. Remember, Passover, death. Unleavened bread, burial. They buried him and our sins are buried with him in baptism. And a few days later, in three days, He rose from the dead. It was the feast of first fruits, the day after the Sabbath following Passover. Is that not awesome, God? Isn't that wonderful? So our sins are buried in baptism when we go down. Well, we're going to read the scriptures to show, to prove all of this. Okay, I'm getting excited. Okay, let's go to Acts 26. And uh, 22 and 23. Acts 26, 22 and 23. Sister Tiffany. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing to small and great, both, both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Okay, guys, listen. Things we just skip over when we're reading. It says that he is not Brother Luke witnessing, saying only those things, using only the word that the prophets and Moses said would come linking the resurrection of Christ with what was said by Moses and the prophets in the Old Testament, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, the first fruit. I'm telling you, I'm just, I'm excited. I'm going to read John 12. John 12 and 23 and 24. John 12, 23 and 24 says, and Jesus answered them saying, the hour is come that the son of man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. That is what he had to do. And we're going to talk about this scripture uh, more a little later on. But he had to go into the ground. He had to be buried. Anyway. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a wave offering presented to the father as the first fruits of the harvest that would come at the end of the age. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Sister Tiffany, if you would read that. 1 Corinthians 15. 
uh, verses 20 through 23. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Praise God. How beautiful is this? He is the first fruits because he was resurrected from the dead. And it says, we'll all be made alive in Christ when we are saved. Every man in his own order. He was the first fruit, but afterwards us. Praise God, resurrection power for us. The, the resurrection power of being saved and the resurrection the resurrection power of being raised from the grave unto eternal life. How beautiful and how wonderful that is. I'm going to go to John 11. John 11, 25 and 26. Seven twenty-five and 26 says, oh yes, Lord. Jesus said unto her, guys, I have to tell you, when I was reading this today, I actually took a lap in my bedroom. I was studying. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Now, this is in the context of Jesus coming after Lazarus had died. He came four days late. But let me tell you, Jesus, even when he's four days late, he's right on time. And he was, that is, that is one of the seven great I am's in the book of John. I am the resurrection and the life. And every time he did one of the I am's, it was, there was something going on where he didn't just speak of who he was, but he demonstrated because here Lazarus died. See, they wanted Jesus to come and heal Lazarus, but that is not what Jesus needed to do. He needed to raise Lazarus up in resurrection power. He didn't need to heal him. He needed him to die so he could raise him up. Praise God. So he says, I am the resurrection. It has been said that the resurrection is an event. And that is how modern Christians treat the resurrection, which is what we call Easter. It is not an event. I used to think it was an event, even though I didn't call it Easter. I would say Resurrection Day, but I still treated it as an event. It's not an event, it's a person. The resurrection is a person. The resurrection is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the resurrection. He was the first fruits of the resurrection. He said, I am the way. The way is not an event. The way is not even a path. The way is a person. So we have insulted 
Jesus by acting as if the day we celebrate his resurrection, which every Sunday is resurrection, representative of resurrection. That's why the New Testament church started to meet on Sundays because he was resurrected on the first day of the week. And we have insulted the person and the work of Jesus Christ by this event where we all go to church, we buy new clothes and hats. And even more than that, to celebrate it with eggs and rabbits. How insulting is that? That power, that resurrection power that has been deposited in us through the Holy Ghost. And we forget. And now, even those of us who know better are accepting of things like Easter basket. It has nothing to do with the resurrection. Easter is a pagan holiday that was put into the church during the reign of Constantine, I believe. The pagan holiday. We celebrate, we can celebrate resurrection day, but without all of that other stuff. He said, I am the resurrection and the life because after the resurrection comes eternal life. I understand that some people say we're taking all the fun away from the children. Again, if we're gonna do this thing called church, if we're gonna do this thing called salvation, we need to do it according to the word of God. And nowhere in the word of God does it tell us that Jesus Christ had anything to do with dying eggs, eating chocolate candy, and rabbits multiplying. Actually, I think the rabbits lay the eggs. Uh, that's the, I mean, come on, guys. He is the resurrection. He's opened the way for us to be a part of the resurrection. Colossians 1 and 18. I don't even know why I have that. I'll read that one, Tiffany. Colossians 1 and 18 says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. The firstborn from the dead. So let's talk some more about first fruits. Romans 8 and 23. Sister Tiffany, and just stay on Romans for a while. Romans 8 and 23, just keep your Bible scriptures in Romans right now. Romans 8 and 23 says, what Tiff? And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Praise God. First fruits of the spirit and redemption, glory. Romans 11 and 16, I will read. 
Romans 11 and 16 says, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. He's holy. Are we holy? The first fruit is holy. Are we holy? Tiffany, Romans 16 and 5. Sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulty. Romans 16 and 5. Yeah. Likewise, likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well beloved Epinatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Okay. So we see that first fruits can also be individual believers that were one to Christ. By other saints. We are the first fruits of Sister Anne and Pastor Don. Praise God. Amen. James 1 and 18. I'm going to James 1 and 18 says, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruit of his creature. Wow. He was the first fruit and he begat us to become first fruits by what? The word of truth. This wonderful word that we are studying tonight. Praise God. Revelation 14 and 4, Sister Tiffany. Revelations 14 and 4. Mm -hmm. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Okay. Wow. Good. The first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Those that follow the Lamb wherever he Go. First fruits all the way to the end. So the scriptures say that that wave offering was made on the day after the Sabbath. And I already went over that. He was crucified on Friday, rose three days later on Sunday morning. And the festival of first fruits had begun when he rose from the grave. He was the first fruit that had been waiting for hundreds of years to come forth. It is important to note that uh, Jesus was born. It was one of the greatest, it was the greatest event that the world has ever known. But in the gospel, it doesn't say the birth or the life of Jesus Christ. Is the gospel is the good news of the death burial and resurrection. 
of Jesus Christ. Even though he was God, his birth could not save us. His life could not save us. Just his death could not save us. Just his burial could not save us. He had to be resurrected because all the major religions of the world had a good man who died, but nobody claimed to be raised from the dead without his resurrection. There is no gospel. Something else that's interesting is that the day Jesus was resurrected on the feast of first fruit was when Mary Magdalene, who was crying at the tomb, heard Jesus' voice and turned to him. Well, let me read that. John 20 and 17. Gospel of John 20 and 17. Let's read that. Actually, I'm going to go to 15. John 19 and 15. I'm sorry, John 20 and 15. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus said unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Now, we read, in Leviticus that the uh, they could not touch their their crop, their grain, their the, the fruit of their labor. They could not touch it until they had gone to the priest the tabernacle and brought it as a wave offering to the Lord. They had to do that first. Then they could come back and eat it, do whatever they had to do. So Jesus said, don't touch me. Why? Because I have not yet ascended to the father. Those first, that first food had to be presented to himself. So we see how the first fruit, everything about it points to Christ. He said, you can't touch me yet. I have to go. I have to ascend. And then I'm going to come back. Wave offering before the Lord. He had to touch. He had to go. He had to touch heaven before he could have any human kind. The Feast of First Fruits was celebrated with and is a part of unleavened bread. Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits are also close together. We have to remember that the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a type of burial of sin in the watery grave of baptism. The Feast of First Fruits, we buried it when we went down. The Feast of First Fruits is a type of the saint rising up into newness of life. All those sins are down in that watery grave. We don't have them on anymore when we're baptized in the name of Jesus and we come up a new creature because we left those sins down in that wall. And we will, and, and of course, Everybody that gets baptized, 
doesn't get saved. But that is on each individual believer. Because when, when we truly believe and we do it, we leave those sins. It says in Acts 2 and 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 5 through 10. Sister Tiffany, if you would read that one, please. Because when we are truly repentant believers, you know, a lot of times we say we don't know if somebody really repented. Most of the time you can because their lives change. They go in a different direction from where they are. Their conduct changes. They do not hold on to those things that are supposed to be washed away. So anyway, Colossians 3, 5 through 10. This what is how we are supposed to do once we are converted. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime, when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Okay, that is what we should do. Mortify means to kill. He didn't say, I will kill it for you. He says, you kill. You mortify, therefore, your members. You do it. You get rid of your sinful act. Fornication is a sin, guys. It didn't stop being a sin because we're modern and everybody doing it. It's still a, it's still a sin right there in Colossians. <laughs> And uncleanness, inordinate affection, all, that's all kind of just nasty stuff. Just, just nasty. The world is nasty now. Evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. The God's wrath comes down on these people who do this. So you used to walk in these things when you weren't saved, but now you have to put off. He says, you put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, all of those things that our mouths make us sin so much. And then he says, filthy the communication out of your mouth as well. If you say you saved and you cursing, it's just, I used to say cussing Christians, Really, that is a contradiction that cannot be true. Cussing and a Christian. Stop lying. Again, you put off that old man because after baptism, you have arisen a new creature and you put on the new man, which is in the image of Christ which is in the image of Christ. Now, my last scripture that I have for us, since we are in the first fruits, being, being raised up in newness of life from baptism in the footsteps of Jesus, I'm gonna read that last. But before we go there, because if I don't have time, I will just start off next week, Bible study with. Um, 
God had shown Sister Tiffany something concerning the first fruits. And I just wanted her to share some of that with us tonight. Sister Tiffany. I do, it's, um, I, I was just going to share um, a bit of, it was something that, um, that actually happened with Sister Anne. Um, the, the New Year's Eve before she passed away, the Lord had given me a dream. And in that dream, um, he showed me the ingredients to put together to, be, to, to bake unleavened bread. And um, he told me to bake seven loaves of it, not for the communion that we were getting ready to take, but he said to bake them and to give them to her. And we took communion that, um, uh, you know, at our New Year's Eve services, as we always do, which um, celebrates Passover. And um, then she had those seven loaves that um, I gave her, which later, it wasn't until a year later, I realized that that was, you know, the um, unleavened bread, the seven days of unleavened bread. And it was that um, month later at the end of February that she passed away. And um, when she passed away, um, there was the, when I was in St. Louis and I was trying to pray and we were interceding, um, that morning, I could hear the angels of God. I went into an intercessory prayer and there were some words that God gave and they were words in tongues. And so I didn't understand what they were, but I did remember the tongues and I actually wrote them down. And I later realized in the, um, in the, uh, um, in the Hebrew language, uh, God revealed to me what those words meant. And it was um, Isha Kenobe Shata. And it was, it meant woman um, that utters or bring forth, brings forth in fruitfulness um, and purpose. And later, about a year later, the Lord said that he sent me to that scripture and understanding what he gave that day. And he said, except a corn of wheat die, you know, and fall into the crown, ground and die. It cannot bring forth the fruitfulness intended. And he made me to understand that Sister Anne in that had finished her, her course. And she went through all of those, um, all of those feasts. Um, but of course she would become uh, resurrected just you know, as the scripture said, when you read that we will also in the likeness of that resurrection, uh, like Christ, we also will rise, but that purpose had been fulfilled. But the fruitfulness of those things that she had performed in the earth would be manifest. There's great fruitfulness to come. And that's what the Lord was saying at that time. So I thought it was a beautiful uh, transitioning or of her life in all of that, that those feasts were also celebrated along that way. Well, praise God for that. Praise God for that. Uh, it's very beautiful. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I have the last scripture here of a repentant believer showing forth salvation and true repentance in their daily living and their conduct, which we do not, I mean, if we are resurrected in the spirit and if we want to be resurrected when he comes back to get us, this is the lifestyle we should live. I'm going to stop. It's not all of it. Uh, but I, I just chose to start at a certain, uh, certain part of things that we just need to get rid of. Ephesians 4. 
we just go to Ephesians 4. And I'm going to begin at verse 21. And I'm just going to keep reading until I get to the end before I lie. And I've finished. So we will begin at Ephesians 4 and 21. I'm sorry, at Ephesians 4 and 20. And before this, uh, there's a whole lot of things as well that we need to do and not do that are in Ephesians, where actually you guys at home read the whole chapter, chapter four. We usually read certain parts of it and we don't read the whole thing. Uh, but it is about our new life in Christ. After it tells us about the fivefold ministry and the perfecting of the saints, then it tells us about how we can be perfected saints. So I'm going to start at verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. The things that he's talking about before, he's saying this is not what you learned in learning about Christ. If you are a believer, if you are a part of him, this is not what you learned to do all these things that are ungodly. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. So many who learned of him and were taught by him through the spirit of God in Sister Anne and Pastor Donnie and others in the ministry. That ye put off, if you learned it, if you heard it, he put off, again, you do it. The Spirit this is not saying he's gonna, the Holy Ghost is going to do it. None of it. He says, you do it. That he put off concerning the form of conversation, which means behavior. The old man, you put off that old man. Just like you're taking off some old clothes. You put off concerning the form of conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Unsaved flesh is corrupt. I don't care how pretty it is, how well dressed it is, how educated it is, how good it sounds or smells. It is corrupt. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put off that old man. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man. You take off the old man and you put on the new man. But first you need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Which after God is created in righteousness. And true hope. The new man. Is righteous and holy. True holiness, not fake holiness, not part holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Don't lie. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. That's your friends in church, your fellow members, your spouse, your don't. Stay angry till the next day. In other words, don't go to bed angry. Lord, and the way things happen now, you could just die and you mad. Or they could die and you mad. Don't, don't, don't even allow that. Don't let that come into your life if you are saved. And don't let your anger make you sin like curse. Neither give place to the devil. Don't give an opportunity to the devil to get into your life and do things through you. Let him that stole steal no more. If you're a thief, stop stealing. But rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needed. You have to be generous. If you Once you are saved, you want to give to others. You're not just working for yourself. It's not all about you. Instead of buying the most expensive dress that you want, you might buy you one and someone else in church one who needs it. Glory, 
Hallelujah. Okay. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. We read that earlier. You know, that's cursing, but that's also talking about things that are uh, not godly. There are certain things we should not even talk about if we are saved. But that which is good to the use of edifying, to lift up, to build up, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Are the words that we speak those that minister grace to those that hear us? Or is everything that come out of our mouth negative and messy? Because you don't have to curse to have corrupt communication. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Many people use this scripture to say once saved, always saved. But what it's saying here, that you can live ungodly to the point where you're grieving the Holy Ghost that is given to us to seal us. But if you're not living according to the standards that God sets for us, you are not sealed. You can unseal yourself. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. These are sins of the heart. Some saints are just always mad at somebody. And some have malice, evil intent. But be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I know he has forgiven me. We have to forgive others the way he has forgiven us. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savior. That's what he did. He loved us enough to die for us. But fornication, is that word again, is still a sin. And all uncleanness, which here is referring to all sexual uncleanness. The only place God puts sex is within the bonds of marriage. Covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become its name. Well, I guess we are a disappointment to the Lord because it is named among the saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. You see this? Filthiness, foolish talking, jesting. It's not convenient. It's not fitting. Some of the things that when we get together, what are we talking about? Is it about the Lord? For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Okay. No whoremonger, people who participate in unclean activities, those who are covetous, you're not going to heaven, which means you're going to hell. That's what it says here. Nobody. And he's talking to the saints. Any of us acting like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't let any man deceive you with vain words or empty words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. See, we want to do things that's acceptable to us and our friends. What is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful work of darkness, but rather prove them. We don't like that scripture. 
because we want to have fellowship with whoever we want to have fellowship with and whatever we want to have fellowship with. We should reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. In decent company. Shouldn't even be talking about some of the things that they do. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Thing, expose the sin. If somebody has a sin, expose it, reprove it. Wherefore, he said, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly or carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I think we can all agree, if we don't agree on anything else, that the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is to do God's will and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Don't drink. Be drunk in the spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one another, one to another in the fear of God. Uh, if we are first fruit of Christ, we have been raised in newness of life. Let's think about all of the things that have been said here tonight. Because God is not accepting any excuses. He loves us. Oh, he loves us. He died for us. But it has to be his way, not our way. Next week, there will be church service on Tuesday night because the Thursday is Thanksgiving and we will not be having service. So we will not have Bible study next week, but tune in to uh the live stream uh church service on thursday on our facebook page and uh the following tuesday we will be back with bible study and we will be studying my favorite feast the feast of pentecost are there any questions or comments